Welcome to this quarter's update with me, Simeon Willis, where we'll give you an overview of the general comings and goings in the markets during the fourth quarter of 2022. I've been reflecting on what an extraordinary year it turned out to be for pension schemes. And this was in no small part driven by the exceptional events in the gilts market uh, that began at the end of September. It feels to me like we're entering into the third phase of that episode. The first stage being the immediacy and dare I say panic of the three weeks following the 23rd of September mini budget, with a large number of pension schemes furiously selling liquid assets in order to satisfy near-term collateral needs to maintain hedges as far as possible. What followed was a more composed period of repositioning where planned target leverage levels were reduced with additional capital source from a whole range of assets, both liquid and illiquid, and hedge targets adjusted to create a more resilient hedging strategy going forwards. The phase we're now in is one where schemes are revisiting their long-term journey plans and strategies. Pension funding on average has improved considerably in the last 12 months, and that's created considerable scope for pension schemes to look for ways to de-risk, be it by selling risky growth assets, increasing fixed income investments, taking advantage of high yields, or looking to the insurance market. Today, I'm joined by Faye Clark, XPS's Head of Manager Research, and Faye's going to get us underway with an update on global inflation and central bank activity. A really important point is that we see inflation prints released globally continuing to drive markets as investors assess the likely extent of further monetary tightening required to slow inflation and reduce it to target levels. UK CPI inflation eased slightly, falling to 10.7% in November from a 41-year high of 11.1% in October. This figure was marginally better than expected. There remains hope that inflation will continue to fall, but potential for inflation to remain elevated, remaining present. As per the public sector strikes by nurses, rail and postal workers, labour shortages, along with the current lack of clear long-term strategy from the government. During the quarter, the Bank of England continued to increase interest rates for the ninth meeting in a row at their December meeting, raising rates by a further 0.5% to 3.5%. The US Federal Reserve, the Fed, also raised rates by 0.5% at its December meeting to a range of 4.25 to 4.5%. This increase was lower than the 0.75% increase seen at the last four Fed meetings and followed a second successive reduction in US CPI. In Europe, the European Central Bank raised the deposit rate to 2%. Alongside interest rate rises, central banks have also been unwinding quantitative easing measures and reducing the amount of assets on their balance sheet. Market expectations remain that the UK, US and Europe will continue to increase interest rates into 2023. This was also reflected by the central bank policy statement reiterating that rates will need to rise further and likely remain high to get inflation down to expected levels. This has given the sustained challenges faced globally, including the war in Ukraine, related supply chain disruptions and the continued strength of labour markets. Sterling stays something of a comeback over the three months, rising by 8% versus the US dollar. This provides reassurance in terms of an improving perception of the UK on international markets, whilst detracting from the returns that a sterling investor will have earned on unhedged overseas investments. A useful side effect is that sterling appreciation helps dampen domestic inflation too, as it makes imports cheaper and every little helps. Global developed markets uh, in the equity space posted positive returns over the quarter. This would have been stronger, but for a sharp pullback over December, uh, along with the currency effects for an unhedged sterling investor. The equity market as a whole has felt like a game of cat and mouse, uh, with markets trying to anticipate future interest rate rises and depth of likely recession, constantly correcting for not having got it quite right. Emerging market equities earned a similarly positive return to global equities in local currency terms, but were more impacted by sterling appreciation, lagging developed market equities over the period. Following widespread protests against strict lockdown, China suddenly lifted many of their COVID-related restrictions early in December, but is now believed to be battling a fresh challenge in the form of a significant COVID infection wave. Faye, what have you seen uh, in terms of the credit markets? 
In bond markets, credit spreads tightened over the quarter for both investment grade and high yield bonds, despite an expectation of rising defaults this year and next, particularly in high yield. The market appears to be looking beyond this. Over to private markets now, including assets like private equity, private credit, infrastructure and property, which on the face of it have had a more successful 2022 than many other asset classes. However, this is due in part to lagged valuations, given the assets aren't traded. Many of these assets are expected to experience some level of write down in asset values to the end of the year. This expectation results from a delayed effect of the market pressures that have been observed in 2022, both in terms of a rising rate environment, uh, increasing the cost of debt and leveraged investments, as well as fire sale of illiquid assets by pension schemes to shore up their LDI strategies. This is important to bear in mind when interpreting funding levels of schemes that have large allocations to illiquids. On that topic, let's take a look at how pension scheme funding levels have been affected. UK DB pension schemes funding levels were highly volatile in October during the guilt crisis, but they were much more stable over November and December. Over the quarter as a whole, there is a fall in the present value of liabilities, driven by both falling inflation expectations and rising yields combined with assets benefiting from modest equity returns and credit spreads tightening. Ultimately, this has led to an improvement in the aggregate DB UK funding level. Lastly, our overview wouldn't be complete without a glance ahead at our outlook for the different asset classes. As 2023 unfolds, we fully expect the day-to-day -day reality of the economy to remain a difficult place. The war in Ukraine is regrettably showing no signs of ending in the near term, and homegrown labour market issues all indicate we have some difficulty to overcome. However, markets are forward-looking, and as demonstrated by the market troughs in 2009-2020, which occurred in the midst of the greatest uncertainty, so too is the scope for markets to perform strongly well ahead of the economy. With this in mind, let's take a look at our outlook. Developed and emerging market equities have been upgraded to neutral, reflecting the extent that existing risks are now priced in, and the opening up of China, which makes up a substantial portion of the EM index. Upgraded outlooks for a number of the private market asset classes reflect a handsome discount that's selectively available in the market due to, in part, for selling. It's worth pointing out that the stale valuations mean that material price falls are yet to come through in report valuations for some of these asset classes. We continue to be favourable on equity protection strategies and for buy-ins, in particular for transactions above uh, £100 million or pensioner buy-ins with shorter durations. I hope that's given you a good overview of the markets during uh, the fourth quarter of 2022 and also a feel for what may lie in store in 2023. That's it from Faye and I for today, but for more information on the topics covered, please get in touch or see our website.